Welcome to Fast Effect Double Speed Magic the Gathering from ELD's Time Vault Games Discord, as we are playing live over the internet every Wednesday and Friday. You can actually join in the fun. Link in the description to see how. We've got Heather here on Death and Taxes versus Matthew on, I believe, what's going to be Storm. We'll see. Don't always get these correct. Trying to get used to uh, getting PM'd from people to let me know what their lists are. Silence that phone. All right, we got Tropical Island with a preordain. So could be Storm, could be Omnitel. Little chance of being like a Rug Delver uh, list. A basic planes go. Not the best opening for death and taxes. Got to imagine there's going to be a turn two Thalia here. And there she is. Not a not a whole lot of keepable hands with death and taxes with no turn one play and not having Thalia on turn two. That starts to get outside of the range of keepable hands. There are some decks where turn two Stoneforge could potentially be enough to justify a keep, but I mean, you really want Aether Vial, Mother of Runes versus decks that are heavy in removal, or of course Thalia to stop some of the more dangerous decks in the format, the more explosive decks. We've got two mana for a Thoughtseize, and that's going to be able to take a Flicker Wisp, Swords to Plowshares, or a Gite. I got to imagine Gite is going to be the easy choice here as it sets quite a clock. Though honestly, this is a bit of a nightmare here for Storm. Double Wasteland incoming? Wow. I think we can expect the Swamp to be ported here. And the green source likely to be Wastelanded. Try and get away from any type of possible answers. Maybe she'll go after the blue. Let's see. Wastelanding right away. Oh, she's going to try and cut off the cantrips. Also a very valid way of playing that. Two damage coming in. And Wasteland taking out Tropical Island. And how does this feel to be at one mana with against a Rashadon Poor and a Thalia? Not very good. Realistically, not going to need any support from here. It's going to be incredibly difficult for Storm to dig out of this. Thalia just so strong versus Storm. There are many other combo decks that are starting to emerge in Legacy, which actually don't care about Thalia very much at all, and that's part of the reason why they're emerging. I mean, she just means at least 10 more mana necessary to combo off in so many games when you're talking about Storm. I mean, that's just incredible, the amount of extra mana needed. Now, it can be done. Here we have a Flicker Wisp to speed up the clock. Instead of four more swings, now it'll be two. And that is enough for Matthew as he scoops it up. No real chance for victory there. That is pretty much how you draw it up against Storm. Have them not have a nut hand and just land a turn two Thalia. Now post board, we're going to see a lot of removal. One thing that I would consider an error from many Death and Taxes players that I've, I've played against with Storm is Mother of Runes actually getting sideboarded out. And I think that's a really important card post-board to protect your Thalia and make sure that it actually sticks. It's really no difficulty at all for Storm to just find a Chain of Vapor or an Abrupt Decay and get a single threat like Thalia out of there. So much more difficult when you're dealing with Mother of Runes. And of course, Death and Taxes is going to have additional bears that they can bring in. Aether Sworn Canonist is a very scary card to contend with. Uh, at the end of the day, none of them are really as good as Thalia, though. Like, even Aether Sworn Canonist, 
I have smashed that card before just playing a bunch of artifacts and then an empty the Warrens, and it's brutal. It's just like, oh no, like I had the turn two bear, like I should win, and it's like, no, I just play a bunch of artifacts and just kill you anyways. And pretty much all of the other hate bears have some way around some type of claws giving you some outs, whereas Thalia just consistently going to cost more because you're not playing any creature spells. They're all non-creature spells when you're playing Storm, with the exception of, you know, an occasional Bomat Courier or Xanted Swarm, which is not going to be in this match. Not not Bomat Courier. Uh, Hope of Girapur. <laughs> Nobody should play Bomat Courier under any circumstances. I believe that card is a trap. You can let me know in the comments if that's too harsh, but I've just seen that work out very poorly. Almost every time it's been played at a higher level. I mean, maybe you get the wins in the earlier rounds of the tournament, but by the time you're playing into the top eight, there's just so many opportunities for it to go sideways. Death and Taxes is definitely going to need to be selective here with their hand. Storm can potentially keep a more speculative hand, especially if they have access to their basic lands. You're going to hope game two here against Death and Taxes to be fetching out basic islands, basic swamps, mostly basic islands so you can play your cantrips and kind of sculpt to where you need to be. And here we've got a Thoughtseize, which on the play can be excellent. And we've got a Mother of Runes, a Revoker, a Sarah Avenger card that we haven't seen very often. And Matthew's got a decision to make here. Phyrexian Revoker, the most interactive of the cards. Aether Vial going to give Death and Taxes the biggest advantage in terms of, uh, you know, in a vacuum without measuring it against the Storm deck. So in a vacuum, Aether Vial going to provide a ton of mana advantage and really makes cards like Flicker Whip so much better. Just going to use this vial end of turn to put in Mother of Runes. And at that point, if Matthew doesn't have a response, it's going to be very difficult to remove any other threats moving forward. I actually used to sideboard Caracas in my Storm deck. Just as an excellent answer that you can easily add Nauseam into. And just much harder for Death and Taxes to prevent that first bounce. Now Aether Vial can be an issue there, putting the Thalia back down. We've got a Brainstorm in response to Umazawa's Jite. At least the Jite can be removed easily, as can the Aether Vial. Mother of Runes only giving protection to creatures. And I find really, it kind of changes the way you think of Batter Skull as well. When you're really relying on Mother of Runes in certain matchups, Batter Skull's stock tends to go way down and that you can't actually protect it. You end up needing to be much later in the game and relying on its ability to pay three mana to return to hand. Which is totally doable. Just a bit slower. And one of my favorite batter skull interactions is returning it to hand against a dredge. A lot of the time, dredge players don't realize how dead they are on turn three. Once you get that batter skull down, they start doing math, thinking about how many zombies they're going to need, how they're going to get past it. Reality is they're not going to be getting zombies because you can just pay three to return it to hand and exile all the bridges and then just plop it back down on the battlefield. But here so far, no real hate from death and taxes, just a clock. And you got to feel like this favors Matthew quite a bit. With the way that this is played out, i got to imagine that that face-down card is going to be Thalia. I mean, that's certainly what Heather is messaging by leaving the Caracas open instead of using the Wasteland. Dark Ritual. No. No, it is uh, perhaps just a bluff. Perhaps 
not being very concerned about some of the potential cards that Matthew could have, the ability to sack those lands for black mana with the bubbling muck, is it? Let me, let me know what the card is that's uh, often in the sideboard there for Storm. Tons and tons of mana and Pass and Flames allowing for everything to be replayed here into the Tendrils. And that is going to do it. Just Death and Taxes with no Disruption to speak of outside of the Phyrexian Revoker, which got Thoughtseize there. Going to be much less excited by Thoughtseize in Game 2. I'm sorry, in game three here on the draw. Matthew really just going to be hoping for a turn one win. And Heather going to be hoping for the opposite, just something that can drag this out. The longer the game goes, kind of... Well, the mid-game favors death and taxes, as long as they have a presence. If you give Storm long enough, they will just find a way out of the situation... So a clock is important. It's just pretty difficult to have any prison elements on board and not have them set a clock. I mean, they're all creatures, so even Athalia, as we saw in game one, able to chip away for two damage a turn will be enough to put the game away very often against Storm as long as you're going after their mana, not letting them just pile up tons and tons of lands to play around her taxing ability. It's a matchup that I have played quite a lot of. It's funny, I in Vintage have mostly played combo control decks, so I kind of think of myself as a control player. Very often I'm going to have Force of Will at the ready or Mana Drain. In Legacy, I, I've been playing a lot of crazy stuff since getting the store. Death, or not Death and Text, uh, Cephalid Breakfast, I've sleeved up quite a lot. I'm currently... Playing around with a Cloud Post blue-green hybrid Euro list, which has been pretty fun. People like to see that so far. The response has been really positive. And did jam some Belcher for a little bit. But yeah, my core, I kind of usually feel like I want to be sleeving up Force of Will in some type of combo finish. But I have played a lot of Storm to the point where some people actually only know me as a Storm player, which blows my mind. Mostly from, you know, playing Magic for 25 years. Just played so many decks. But Storm is very, very capable of allowing for lines that people just don't see. The, the difference in between an experienced Storm player and somebody who's just learning the deck couldn't be more pronounced. There's no easier matchup in Magic than a a bad, for lack of a better word, Storm player. Like, they will accidentally kill themselves, they'll miscount mana. I mean, there's just all sorts of things which can go sideways for Storm players when it's just a little inaccurate. Here we have that Thoughtseize, and we see the Thalia, also a Stoneforge and a Surgical. So, Thalia... Going to be taken here, and man, that Aether Vial is going to be pulling its weight, allowing for all sorts of responses down the line. Now, the lack of a white source here for Heather is uh, not inconsequential. Aether Vial is going to do some heavy lifting. Uh, but it can't do the final kind of lift of putting in a planes or white source to allow for Stoneforge Mystic to activate. So basically going to have a squire. Oh, and I missed what that surgical took. We got to see the hand. We saw the Massacre in there, which is a very scary card. Oh, nice. Heather top-decking the planes. So this game, very, very different now. Matthew's hand's still super dangerous, 
Brainstorm could be literally anything, even a boat. I guess, or even a brainstorm. Could brainstorm into another brainstorm. Which often is actually really good. Like when you brainstorm into like a fetch land and another brainstorm and you play the fetch land, shuffle away and then get to see three new cards, it's a complete transformation from a kind of mediocre hand potentially into just a game-winning hand. So Heather grabbing the planes off the top of the deck and Matthew disconnecting here. I'm going to skip ahead until he comes back. Oh, gross. So Heather, looking to find a batter skull, picks up the deck, realizes that it's not in there. So she has actually had a 51 card deck. Matthew going to get the option. Uh, so the way the rules work, that's not a game loss anymore. That used to just straight up be a game loss. Uh, Matthew gets the option to kind of make that right. So with that search ability still on the stack, he gets to look at the 16 card sideboard and choose the card to shuffle into the deck. And Matthew being a good sport there, choosing the batter skull, Heather able to find it. Very sporting. At a little bit of a disadvantage even, because if the batter skull is in the deck, like, you'd rather not have the batter skull in the deck? Because if you draw it, it's terrible. Like, if you draw the batter skull instead of the stone forge, that's a disaster. So, very sporting there of Matthew. We'll see if the magic gods reward him for that. We've got a wishclaw talisman coming in. Three counters. And this still feels like it very much favors Matthew. Now, a couple of hits from the Batter Skull will change that. As those life totals start to invert, Matthew's life total gets lower, cards like Ad Nauseam stop becoming an option, and then it also becomes more difficult to tendrils your opponent out. A lot of combo decks don't actually care what your opponent's mana or life total's at. Things like Aluren, Eureka Tell, Infect. So many combo decks really don't care what your life total is. Storm mostly doesn't care. It does end up carrying at some point because there is a there is a limit to how much damage you can do. It's not actually infinite with Storm. It can be very, very high. I mean, certainly, if you have to, if your opponent's been gaining life with some Soul Wardens or something, and you need to do like 100 damage, it, it can be done. We've got an Infernal Tutor here revealing Cabal Ritual. And I got to imagine this is going to be do or die for Heather. She's going to need just a savage top deck. Unless it's already in her hand, which seems unlikely. Something that'll just win the game. Oh, and there it is. Reign of Filth. That's the card I was trying to remember earlier. So sacrificing for two black. Cabal Ritual. Going to five. Going to 8 now. And all we're really missing is a red mana for a Past in Flames. Looks like we're going to end up with an Ad Nauseum. And plenty of mana floating. There's the Ad Nauseum. Peer into the Abyss also would have been totally fine. Possibly better. Probably better. Half the deck is pretty sick. Though I've seen plenty of Ad Nauseums go for, you know, 20 plus cards. Alright, so that Wishclaw Talisman. Gonna be all Heathers if this doesn't work out. And here we go. Losing some life. There's the Infernal and the Lion's Eye. 
That'll literally do it right there. Oh, this is very over. As long as Matthew doesn't somehow, I guess, I don't even know. I'm, I can't even come up with a way he loses from here. There are some times where if you draw the Infernal and then you draw the Tendrils, then it's really awkward because you don't have enough mana to use the Tendrils and kill. It's just a couple of times. I mean, it's so rare. I mean, he's got this in the bag. All of this mana. And he's got the backup plan. Worst case scenario of just emptying for like a billion. Still has that extra black mana. He can sack for Reign of Filth if needed. And Infernal Tutor cracking LED. And, you know, he might have actually had enough mana to empty the Warrens there. Uh, just in case Heather had something, like just, I can't even think of what she could have there, like a silence or something that she was just being super disciplined with. Uh, but yeah, Matthew takes that one down and is a good sport, allowing Heather to get that batter skull, uh, despite it being accidentally left behind in the sideboard. So, well done. And a, a great match there. Hope you guys enjoyed that one as much as I did. That is all for this one. But don't worry, there is a lot more. Uh, you can check out our older videos. And we're always putting out new videos from ELD's Time Vault Games in Bellingham, Massachusetts. If you want to help the channel, of course, you can like, subscribe, share, tap that notification bell so you can know uh, the next time our new videos come out. Thanks for watching.